Hi everyone, welcome back to um, track two, session two. Uh, we've got three very interesting talks coming up shortly. Um, first about soft robotics, um, and then if, if any of the talks that are going on today have piqued your interest to work with us, we've got a talk um, from a number of, of people um, about how you, you can get funding, uh, government funding and other, other sources of funding for collaborations. Uh, and then finally, a talk from um, Praminda Kalabsoli, who will be telling us about assistive robotics work. Um, so with no further ado, um, I shall introduce you to Helmut Hauser, who's going to talk to us about soft robotics. Um, soft robotics is definitely a, a huge step change in, in how robotics uh, works now uh, and certainly will work in the near future. Um, uh, I'm going to let the expert tell you all about it. So, Helmut, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, hello and welcome, everyone, to my presentation on the great potential of soft robotics for industry. So, first, my name is Helmut Hauser. I'm a senior lecturer in robotics at the University of Bristol, and I'm also with the Bristol Robotics Lab. And I'm also director of the Center for Doctoral Training for Robotics and Autonomous Systems, where we have around 50, 55 students, PhDs who are working on soft robotics. And this is a shared program between the University of the West of England and the University of Bristol. And most of this work is actually carried out in the Bristol Robotics Lab. But not all of them are doing soft robotics. So today I'm gonna focus on soft robotics, which is also my field of expertise. And I'm doing that in my role as the lead of a UKRS strategic task group for soft robotics that is sponsored by UKRS. And um, what we're trying to do is, as part of this group, we're trying to promote soft robotics in the UK. So we're in a very lucky situation here in the UK that we have excellent research groups in soft robotics, which is a quite a recently emerged field in robotics, which has gained a lot of momentum and therefore has a lot of potential. But having the academic side uh, is not enough. What we want to do is really to translate it into useful application to make a beneficial impact for a society here in the UK and to solve big societal problems with the help of soft robotics. So that's why we try to raise uh, awareness with a range of events where we outreach to different groups, for example, non-roboticists that could be in academia who can contribute to the field, which is by its definition, very interdisciplinary field, as you're going to see, uh, but also potential end users um, in academia and outside, stakeholders, um, but also industry, because um, there's a lot of challenges in industrial applications that cannot be solved with conventional robotics um, and people looking for solutions. And there's a huge potential for soft robotics to step in and find new um, and creative solutions to old problems, so to say. And also as part of our work, we try to build up a community around the topic. Like I said, there's a very strong academic community, but we want to reach out, broaden it, get more people on board to understand what the needs are. So we are developing research and solutions uh, and robotic systems that are actually at the end useful and have a positive impact. And finally, we also here to facilitate any interaction between these different groups. So if you're from industry, and you have a very specific interesting challenge which you cannot solve with conventional robotics um, i'm pretty sure on the soft robotic side there is somebody who's doing research and who might have already solved this problem or can solve it with the tools they have available and we bring these two sides together so you can work on a proposal work to get on solutions and incorporate soft robotics in problem solutions there like I said in the beginning, um, I'm leading this uh, group, but I'm not alone. Um, if you want to know more about us, uh, we have a Twitter handle, Soft Robotics UK, and also a corresponding web page where we announce all our events. We're also going to build up a database with all the people involved, so you can look up people if you're looking for a specific expertise, for example. And the web page is softrobotics.uk. And my co-leads are uh, in Cambridge and Imperial College, and it's led here in the University of Bristol. But there are many more people involved. So at the beginning, uh, when we wrote a proposal for this task group, uh, we had quite a wide range of academics involved, as you can see, but also um, quite diverse range of um, partners from industry um, with different kind of possible application cases. And 
Since then, this group, both on academia and industry side, has grown significantly. And if you want to join us, uh, reach out to us. Um, we are here to help, to connect, to, to find solutions uh, for any problems that you might have. Okay, this let me then move over to the actual talk where I want to convince you that there is a huge potential for soft robotics in industrial applications. But in order to do that, we really have to understand first what is soft robotics at its core. And I put here Baymax um, as a famous figure from Disney, which is a soft robot, which is inflatable. And um, while it's a really nice character, soft robotics is much, much more than just inflatable robots. And the question is why we want to do soft robotics. What is the advantage? And I think in order to really understand that, we have to take a step back and look at conventional robotics and how we build robots usually, and then see why soft robotics is different and where it can be advantageous to use soft robotic techniques. And the, basically the best way to describe we build robots is that we have a very limited set of tools. We basically build robots the same way since the beginning of the field, since it was called cybernetics last uh, century. It's really just using rigid body parts. A lot of time it's metal, sometimes it's plastic, and then connect those with high dock server motors and maybe a pneumatically or directly driven motor. But these are basically the only two tools that we use to build our machines. And the reason is, well, because if you build them so simple with rigid body parts and electric motors, we get something that can be very easily modeled and therefore very easily controlled. So it's a very good engineering-based uh, motivation to build systems like that. And that's also the success story of robotics, right? Because we have built all the tools around that with control theory, with digital computation, which has increased significantly in power and, and how much cheaper it got and in precision. Um, so that's why soft robotic, uh, sorry, rigid robotics, conventional robotics is very successful. But we also have to recognize that it's very limited through this limited toolbox. It's very limited what you can do because the implicit assumption in this building approach is that you also need to have a very good model about the object that you want to handle or the environment you want to work in. Now, usually that's not the problem if you have an assembly line where you have robots behind some fences and you make sure everything is controlled environmentally for the robot so the robot doesn't have to be clever at all. But the problem is if we blur these lines between the real world, well, outside of the very constrained uh, workshop condition, when you suddenly introduce a human collaborator, you get something which is not so easily predictable. Humans are really hard to predict what they're doing. It can be very dangerous if you have a very powerful robot. And if you don't have a good model, you get in a very dangerous situation. Also, if you take this robot out into the open world where it's really noisy, we don't know how the floor is, if you walk through the forest, for example, and so on. A lot of people are running around, maybe there's a cat, a dog. So the environment is not controlled, very hard to model, very noisy, very complex. And then, the systems don't work anymore. This is also the reason why, despite of decades of decades of roboticists and generations of roboticists are promising us that we soon have our robotic butler, we don't see robotic systems that are walking around and do our groceries or washing our dishes because the problem is much, much more complex. So the question is, how can we overcome these limitations? And this is where soft robotics starts. It was also partially inspired by nature, where we can see biological systems seemingly don't have any issues with these very complex environments. And we are very soft. And actually, if you look even closer, we can see that biological systems are outperforming robotic systems, state-of-the-art robotic systems, in almost any task there is. Robots are only really good at moving fast and precise and do it 24 seven, but only in a very limited controlled environmental space. But we are very energy efficient, running around. We, we can learn, we can adapt, we can pick up a different object, walk on different grounds, and so on. We are very, we can fall over uh, and we're not going to hurt, and so on. So you can see there's a big difference between what could be possible and what is currently possible. And this is where soft hypothesis I get really inspired and say, okay, what about not just using these two tools of rigidness and electric motors, but actually extending the toolbox? And that's exactly what soft robotics is doing. 
we think about machines not just as something rigid and hard and static, but rather something that can be much, much more. So we use silicon, polymers, hydrogels, chemistry, paper, wood, smart materials, and all the combinations out of those and many, many more. So we think about the machines like growing machines. We think about machines that incorporated in the body, with the body, with the environment, and so on. And suddenly, the way we think about machines are opening up, but also the design possibilities are opening up. We get many more possibilities how we can build machines, and therefore, we have a huge potential of what could be a solution for problems, for example, in the industrial context. Now, let me give you a few concrete examples of where I think these are very good points where you could start to look at uh, industrial problems where soft robotics could have an advantage. The first one I already implicitly told you, I think expanding this kind of toolbox allows us to be much more creative. So it inspires a out of the box thinking. We don't have to build a machine with rigid body parts as a robot arm, but actually it can be much, much more. This means we can get to solutions that we've never thought about before because we were so constrained in the way we think about what a machine is and what a robot is. So to give you one example, people, for example, have built a robot with coffee. I didn't mean they built a robot that can make coffee, which is nice as well, but they used literally coffee as a material to build a robot. So this is based on the observation if you buy ground coffee, usually comes vacuum sealed, right? And it's very stiff, the package. And then if you pinch it, the air gets in and it gets very soft. Now you can reverse this process by sucking out the air again and it gets stiff again. This is a process called jamming. And you can exploit that, for example, to build a gripper. So people build, for example, a coffee balloon gripper. So that's a picture of this one. And it's literally a balloon that you fill with ground coffee. And then you need some kind of mechanism at the end that can suck out the air either with a syringe or with a pump and let the air in again. And then you can use this one to pick up different objects. So in the soft mode, so if the air is let in, it's very soft and malleable, you can touch on an object and through its compliance, actually it adapts, it conforms to your object. It doesn't have to know the actual model. It doesn't have to know where it exactly is. As long as it's close enough, it adapts itself by nature. We get that for free. And then you suck out the air, which get hardened up exactly in this position. And then you move it over where you want to let it loose and you let the air in again and it falls down. Let me show you a video of different objects that you can pick up. Soft, press down, it's hard now, release it by letting the air in again. And you can see it can pick up different objects. So this is really hard to pick up with a conventional robotic rigid hand. And also you don't have to be precise at the object, right? It can be a little bit off as long as you're close enough. You don't need a perfect model which is the beauty because the morphology itself adapts to the object. So you are much more um, resilient against um, kind of uncertainty in the environment. As long as you're close enough and you press down, you can pick up all these different objects. So it's extremely versatile. It's really hard to do that with a robot hand. For us as humans, it's quite easy, but we have a really good handling of our hand but it's really hard to reproduce that in, in a robot. So this is very, very powerful because the control is also very simple. It's just moving over to the object, even not extremely precise, just close enough so you can pick it up. And then it's a binary switch on by sucking out the air, a binary switch off to let the air in again. So the control is simplified because you've outsourced some of this kind of control and picking up task to the morphology. And this is a concept also often referred to as morphological computation, which is my expertise. So where we're trying to build more intelligent bodies for our robots, for interaction with objects, for locomotion, for sensing, and so on. Now you can lead to other things here as well, right? Because you can conform to the object and you have some softness, suddenly you can open the space for such a gripper to handle very delicate objects. For example, fruit is a really good example. If you bruise a fruit, it's really hard to sell them. 
So you want to make sure you handle them properly and you can put them in a package and um, send them off. So softness and compliance helps a lot with soft and compliant and delicate objects. Now, fruit is just one example, but there are many more examples. You could think about bakery products, a fresh croissant, for example. You don't want to smash it down with a robot hand. You want to almost pick it up with air-like fingers. And you can literally do that. You can have like plastic fingers that have air chambers. And if you do it in a clever way, if you increase the pressure, they basically bend so you can grasp it. Again, this is a very complex object. So the orientation you would think is very important, but actually having this kind of complex morphology, like in the softness, you can adapt quite easy to different orientation. It does it by its own. So you get this kind of free um, control reduction by having a clever morphology. But also you can think about other projects, uh, products which are really hard to handle. For example, clothes, which are really hard to pick up. So again, if you have softness, or maybe you can change your softness with stiffness, you have a much more wider range of possibilities to handle this very complex uh, products. And of course, at the end, if you want to have something that pick, uh, picks up different kind of objects, right? If you send a robot in to do your grocery at the end, then you have to pick up a bread, some fruit, um, milk, as I can see here. So the different things, there are different kind of hardness and different shapes and forms. So you want to have something that is adaptive and can change and adapt to this kind of uh, object that you want to pick up. And compliance and soft robotics can help you to get this kind of adaptivity right into the morphological properties. So you get more versatile machines at the end. Now, this leads me over to another aspect, which is almost implicit in soft robotic systems. The systems are potentially much more safer than a rigid robot arm. And this is especially important if you have close human robot collaboration, right? In the industrial complex, when you want to have a robot arm or a full robot, a human robot working next to you, you don't want to be uh, in danger just by working next to it. So safety can be increased by having um, a much softer approach to that. Now, this doesn't mean that we should get rid of rigid body parts because they are important as well. If you need precision, for example, then you need a very stiff kind of structure. So ideally, and I think that's the future in, in robotics, is you have systems that can have both sides. They can be soft and stiff, and they can switch between those, right? And there are a lot of materials available and systems in soft robotics where you can change the stiffness uh, as a control variable depending on what you do. So, for example, you are working with a human being, you pick up the product, for example, right, um, or, or some piece, and you be you want to be quite soft so it's a dangerous, and then you move it over to the place where you want to put it in. You want to be really precise. So you want to stiffen up, and then you can have a very precise movement. So you can have both advantages from both worlds, and, and that will be the future here. And of course, anything that you do with the body, human body, like non-invasive surgery is, is, a, is a very good application. Might be not an industrial application, but uh, it gives you the feeling that anything that you do on the body, in the body, uh, needs to be much, much softer than all the rigid things that we use currently. So this also means if you have an exoskeleton, and again, this leads us back to the industrial context, maybe you have really heavy things to lift, you want to have maybe a soft exoskeleton, which is much easier to wear. Maybe you have clothes which are very powerful and it helps you. So you don't have this huge kind of structure that is really awkward to move around, but you have something which a soft suit that you put on and it gets stiff when you need it to get stiff, for example. So there are a lot of possibilities. And I've referred to that before, which brings me to the next point is that the kind of possibilities of using materials that are soft and can change their morphological properties gives us the possibility to be flexible, but also to be very adaptive. So this means we can actually build one system that can be employed for a wide range of different tasks, different objects, different situations. So we don't have to completely change the end effect of a robot arm, for example, because it's so versatile. Like the example I showed with the coffee balloon gripper is exactly like that. 
But this flexibility is also really good because it can confirm with the object or with the environment. So, let, and this could be very useful, for example, in maintenance tasks, right? You don't want to disassemble the whole machine just to check something. So you want to have something that almost like a worm can crawl into this kind of machines, where there's very little space, very bended space, and you want to reach the position where you want to check something. And you can use soft robotic structures, like worm-like structures, where you can carry tools like a camera, a sensor, or even repair tools. So you don't have to get rid of the machine or not rid of the machine, but disassemble it completely and then assemble it again. So you lose a lot of time. Um, and people are working on such robots. Um, for example, this video is from uh, Stanford, but also people here in Queens Mary with Kaspar Althoff is using these kind of robots as well. And they use inflatable robots. Again, you wouldn't have thought about these types of robots in the context of conventional robotics because it doesn't fit this very constrained way to think about how a machine should look like. So how does this uh, inflatable robots work? Well, it's basically a, a tube, like a sock, um, and you put in some air and then it expands and it's like a growing process. But the beauty of that it is, since it's compliant, it adapts to the environment, right? It conforms with the environment. So you don't have to know exact model. It can bend around something because it needs no control in this situation. Now, in addition, of course, you could also add some kind of tendons and you add some additional control if you move in a freer space, for example. And then you can build it with materials, right? They are very resistant. It doesn't have to be like a plastic that burns very easily, but you can build it with any kind of polymer that is soft enough to do that. And you can see these kind of things can be also really, really strong as well to lift objects to go somewhere else. So you can imagine there's a lot of possibilities to increase maintenance in uh, soft uh, in, in, in industrial applications. Uh, this brings me to the fifth point, which might be a little bit surprising, but soft robotic structures are also more energy efficient, at least potentially. And the reason is if you have this machine that has to be autonomously walking around, um, that could be in a situation where you do agriculture, mining, but also if a, a huge, large uh, assembly line and it has to move products around, for example, then you want to have a system that can walk for hours and doesn't have to charge every five minutes. And we can see that, that we in nature, in biology, for example, biological systems, use softness and compliance as a way to actually store energy. For example, our muscle tendon systems, when we have the impact on the ground during running, for example, it basically uh, compresses the springs, stores the energy, and when we take off, we release this energy, which makes us incredibly energy efficient. So you can use that for locomotion, for example, to make much better machines that can work for much longer hours. But even more so, you can think about intelligent materials, smart materials like uh, electroactive polymers that you can use for energy harvesting. So you can uh, use these materials which are stretchable um, and you can stretch them, release them, and you do it repeatedly and you can actually produce electricity to charge something. Now, interestingly, the same material can also be used as an artificial muscle. So you can apply voltage which contracts it, which means you can use it as an actuation system. And at the same time, you can bend it or stretch it and then read out the difference in voltage. And therefore, you can actually measure something like how much it's bending can use as a sensor. So you can use energy harvesting, actuation, and sensing in the same material. So this opens a completely new way how integrated the system can be. In a very small space, you can have everything together on the tip of a finger of a robot, for example, and use this very much as a powerful uh, way to use the machine. So there are a lot of possibilities that you can use very smart materials. And, and every week almost new types of smart materials are coming along also because soft robotics is driving this field very much as well. Now this brings me to point six, resilience. I've pointed out that the systems are quite um, compliant, right? Which makes it really interesting, but they are also extremely resilient because you can use a wide range of materials that can be actually 
made in such a way that they're specifically resilient to, let's say, specific chemistry, specific uh, chemical, specific uh, pH value, temperature, and so on. So you can actually mix your own kind of structure in such a way that you can design it for the specific task. Now, this is just a video to show you um, that this resilience is also embedded in nature. And, and you might have seen videos like that. Uh, we are very often inspired by the octopus um, specifically, but in nature in general, because an octopus doesn't have any bones and it's a very intelligent animal. It can squeeze through these holes. It can walk on land. It uses tools. It uh, mimics other animals and so on. Now, you can imagine if you have a very tough material, but it's also soft, you can use that in very extreme environments, right? For exploration or for maintenance or uh, nuclear decommission and so on. But I also want to show you a soft robotics example. So this is a robot from Harvard, which is dramatically driven. Um, and they show that it walks around um, and well, you can walk over fire, right? If you use the right kind of polymers, um, they also show about where they drive the car over it, uh, just to show how resilient it is. So it walks after that. Now, one would say, what about the electronics on top of that? They are rigid. If you drive over that, it's broken. But actually, there's quite a wide range of groups working on soft, malleable, flexible electronics using uh, liquid metal, for example, or salted water and so on, or chemistry. So there are a lot of things that we can have flexible computation systems, flexible sensors, which again could be very nicely incorporated in existing systems because they're like a skin you put on um, and they work beautifully uh, right out from the box. And of course, these materials can be self-healing as well, right? If you want to decrease maintenance again, you can use it um, and have materials that um, if there is a fissure, they can self-heal themselves. That brings me to the final point, which is also quite economical. A lot of these materials are very, very cheap, often off the shelf. So you can actually build systems which are very versatile, like a coffee balloon gripper, and you can use it uh, in the industrial context. So, Hi, Helmut. Can I just say is, like, a couple of minutes? Is that okay? That's perfect. This is my penultimate slide, and then oh, I'll finish. Typical, typical. Okay, Thank you. I'll leave you to it. Thanks. Thanks. No worries. So just as a summary, um, I think soft robotics has a lot of potential advantages in industrial application. I think one is this kind of open space of design creativity, handling of delicate objects, the potential safety increasement in human-robot interaction, the adaptivity and flexibility of all the systems, energy efficiency, the resilience that we can incorporate in the materials, and also being much cheaper as conventional systems. So for me, I think the future of robotics is definitely soft, um, whether in industry or other applications. It might be partially soft um, because we want to have the best of both worlds. So the future systems will have be rigid parts and soft parts or can change between of those. Now, if you want to know more, um, if you want to get in touch with research groups who are working on these different aspects here in the UK, for example, uh, you can get in touch with us either through the uh, task group or through me. So there's my email address. I'm also on Twitter with MorphComp, uh, like Morphological Computation, and reach out to us. And thank you very much. And I'm looking very much forward to your questions. Wow, fantastic. I'm convinced, Helmut. Um, that was a really, <laughs> really interesting talk. Um, there are quite a few questions, um, but we are quite tight on time. So I'm, I'm just going to be cheeky and choose the... Um, the one that, that looks in, most interesting to me. Um, anyone else, please contact Helmer afterwards if you've got any, any direct questions. Um, so we have a question here from uh, Jim Wormold who asks, why aren't these coffee grippers more commonplace? They look amazing. And I guess that, that sort of covers all of soft robotics because what you've shown <laughs> us is clearly amazing. Yes, that's an excellent question. So um, so the coffee balloon gripper is is, it's not too old, um, but there's actually, there is a spin-off company um, in the US who is actually uh, quite successful and, and they are using it, for example, for product handling, uh, bakery goods and so on, fruits and stuff like this. So it's actually used already in, in industry. Uh, and it's one of the, I would say, one of the first applications, real applications of soft robotics in, in a in real world context. 
Um, but they will become more, right? The field is very young. It's still very explorative. Uh, but yeah, I agree. It's a really cool idea. Brilliant. Well, thanks. Thanks ever so much for that, Helmut. That was fascinating. Um, and for all the viewers, please um, do contact Helmut um, via, via the, the links he shared there. Um, so with, with no further ado, um, I'm going to move on to our next talk, which is from um, David Leonard, who's uh, the head of business and operations within the, um, the BRL. Um, here, here's David. This is going to be a slightly different format talk. Um, we're going to talk about the, David's going to talk us through the, the, the op opportunities for funding um, and introduce uh, a set of the sort of key figures uh, who you can reach out to uh, and, and meet up with to discuss how you can get involved with some of our fascinating work here. So with uh, with no further ado, I'll, um, I'll hand you over to, to Dave. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this, uh, this funding session, uh, which provides an outline of the different funding mechanisms available for industrial partners uh, to collaborate with, with BRL researchers. Um, this includes uh, university administered programs such as KTP's, the Sabre program and UE's Digital Innovation Fund, uh, but also from speakers uh, representing external agencies such as Innovate UK, EPSRC and the West of England Growth Hub. Uh, there will be a few minutes uh, available at the end of the session to ask questions. Uh, so please can you submit these through the chat section of the, uh, the YouTube live stream. Uh, if we do run short of time, um, please feel free to engage directly with the speakers uh, as, as contact details uh, are included on the slides. Um, so I know we've got lots to go through and, and time's tight, so I'm going to hand you straight over now to our first speaker, uh, Ben Mashader, who's the Access to Funding and Finance Manager at Innovate UK Edge, who's going to talk about some of the support mechanisms available. So uh, Ben, uh, over to you. Thanks, Dave. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, um, as Dave says, I'm going to talk you now through some of the stuff Innovate UK are doing. Um, it's going to be a pretty whistle-stop tour. We haven't got long, um, but I'll talk through the Innovate UK family and some of the support available. So you'll probably be aware of Innovate UK. Uh, you're probably more likely aware of the grants they do, but they do a lot more on top of that as well. I won't discuss Innovate UK really with you. I don't think I need to go into that today, but what um, the, you can just read the slides here and get a bit more information. They are the Innovate UK's innovation agency tasked with driving growth and innovation in the UK. And if you want to know more, uh, go to the .gov website and sign up to the newsletters, go to the events. Um, I think there's plenty of information on the internet for you to find there. What I'm going to go into more today is I'm going to talk you through some of the core competitions and some of the grants available and also some of the other support which you can uh, access, which is funded by BASE through the government and delivered through Innovate UK. Um, so you're probably all aware of the, uh, the SMART grant, but there's a lot of other grants available out there from Innovate UK. Um, grants in themselves, they're non-dilutive funding. Um, it's the main way cash-wise that Innovate supports companies grow. There are other ways which I'll get into in a minute, but. Um, this is the, uh, the main one. The SMART grant itself is the, is the flagship of those. It's typically available four times a year, everything from 25,000 up to 2 million pounds available. Um, it's really, what they're looking to fund is kind of really cutting edge, disruptive innovation projects. Um, you can get up to 70% of your costs um, and, and they can be really good if, it's, if, if your projects uh, are suited to that. Um, there are, uh, it's an open, funding competition but there are a lot of thematic uh, grants available out there um, at the moment there's about 11 I think on the, what's called the innovation funding service which you'll find those there's also a finance finder on the UKRI website which covers them as well um, so if you've got a project you want to fund it's worth looking for them a thematic grant before going to something like the open smart grant um, but moving on on to the next thing we're going to talk about is KTPs um, you'd probably be aware of these as well. They're a very long-standing program of support for companies, for SMEs. Um, it's a very descriptive title. It tells you kind of what it's about. If a company is looking to move maybe in a new direction, wants to collaborate with an academic they've identified or, or haven't identified, uh, work more with knowledge base like a university, um, then KTPs can be really good for that. Um, they've got fantastic results. They've been running a long time. It's part funded. It's not a grant. It's um, it's basically you have to pay an amount uh, at the costs towards uh, hiring and, and running it, but the 
uh, KTP that you're applying to is actually for the university and the uh, knowledge basis side of the finance. It's, uh, it's somewhere between sort of 25, 30,000 pounds, 35,000 pounds a year that will cost to run. They can be really good, really good um, results have come out of it. I've run two personally and we've hired the person both times that we've run those. Um, going a bit on uh, from that, we're going to talk about is the SBRI, Small Business Research Initiative. You, these are a little bit like grants, um, but not quite. They're less well known than the grants run by Innovate UK. What these are is sort of pre-procurement contract research with a specific goal in mind. It, typically something which is seen as being um, important from government down. Um, they're excellent for companies to be involved with because there's typically a, a challenge you're trying to solve, which is a real life challenge, which is there. Uh, and maybe what you're going to get at the end of it is, is straight into that commercial opportunity. You maintain your IP and it's 100% funded because it's contract research. So they're fantastic opportunities to look out for. Again, you'll find them on the IFS or the, the Finance Finder. Um, in, in addition to money, we do. A, there's a lot of other things that Innovate UK support. One of those specifically is women in innovation. It's a, quite a new, but it's hugely successful, impactful uh, support programs being run at the moment. It's created with levelling up in mind. As you can see there, there's, there's some stats around why it had to sort of come about. But it is support for women who are in innovative roles uh, or women-led businesses. Uh, you get some, some money for your salary. You get some grants as part of it. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, of stuff around it, which makes it a fantastic opportunity. I'll also mention that Horizon Europe, which I'll come on to in a minute, have committed to about 40% of their huge pot of money to support women-led businesses. So if you are a woman-led business or you know one, then there's a lot of support out there to, um, to look at and go for. Um, the next thing that's been uh, on, on the list is sort of young innovator awards. You may be aware of there's a new one of these out at the moment uh, for, I think there's a month or so left for the application on that. But if you're between 18 and 30, you can apply, you get salary, you get a grant, you get mentoring, and you get exposure to a lot of other young innovators. They're, they're looking to sort of support those next entrepreneurs that are going to really make a difference, going to be the next big noise. Um, they're, they're really good programs to be involved with. I'd suggest going to have a look at those if that sort of um, sounds like you. Um, and then... One of the, the best, the, the, the biggest things that Innovate have been tasked with doing is supporting globalization of, of UK innovations, UK companies. There's lots of ways they can do that. There's a big long list there. Um, Horizon Europe is, is a big one. You can see at the bottom, uh, there's 95 billion euros in the pot to be spent over the next seven or so years. Lots of information online. Go and have a look at that. We're trying to support as many companies as we can because the government wants us to claw back as much of that money we paid to be in the program back. Whether that's going to happen or not, we'll see. Um, but there's support for partnering and stuff through the EEN, uh, Global Business Innovation Programs, and other things. Um, the last thing on the list of, around sort of uh, Innovate UK direct support is the innovation loans. These are fairly new, uh, 250,000 up to 1.6 million at below market rates for uh, risky uh, commercialized, late stage R&D and commercialization projects running over up to a sort of five years. Um, for that timeline can be um, as long as you can convince them that you can you can repay and you've got a very good project um, then you can apply to those um, like I say it's they're, they're brand new and they're running another round uh, I believe soon but it's been a trial up to now um, going on um, some of the other stuff you can find that information on the Innovate UK news there's just the subscribe and, and everything there as I mentioned before and more regionally in the West of England, Southwest, um, and nationally, I suppose this is all replicated. But in the Southwest, uh, specifically where I sort of sit in the Innovate UK Edge Network, that's a newly branded um, business support network that we do, uh, we um, run in the region. Lots of stuff around helping companies grow, innovate, uh, internationalize. Um, I run the team that does the fun, funding and finance aspect of that, so grants and investments. Uh, but we have other teams who run different things, uh, design thinking, uh, collaborations, uh, leadership, marketing. The, the list goes on and on. If, if that support's available, it's fully funded. Similarly, the KTN offers support, a bit more higher level support from the KTN, but it's fantastic what they do. And the Catapult Network in the Southwest, we've got the uh, Composite Centre down in Bristol. Uh, we've got some uh, other bits and pieces down in Cornwall about satellites. 
uh, go and have a look at the website for the event UK Edge if you want to know some more information. There's uh, the news uh, tab you can see there in the top right. You see lots of good case studies on there. There's not a lot of other great information on that website because it's quite new, but the, the news one is where to go and, and you find some fantastic stories from the Southwest as well. Um, the KTN is available to everyone and they have a look at their website, a brand new, very green website they've got. And then finally, the Catapult Center is you know there's information online there there's lots of them nationally nine centers uh, sorry nine catapults but many centers across the uh country across the nation um some of their some of their stuff is funded some of them you have to fund yourself some of the support but there are grants coming out to support people who have some ideas they want to work with the catapult centers and i think that's about all of it for me today sorry it was so quick hope you got all that if you didn't there's some contact details there myself or the um central team will be able to answer your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ben. I will, um, I'll pick up. Hi, everyone. I'm Alison Davis from UE's Research Business and Innovation Team. I'm going to run through a few of the UK funding routes available for business and university collaboration, but I would definitely echo Ben's point about checking out Horizon Europe because there's a huge amount of international collaboration opportunities there. So if we can move on to the next slide, I will kick off with um, a KTP case study just to follow up from Ben's, um, Ben's KTP information. I thought it'd be nice to see a specific example of a funded project that's worked in the past. So this was um, Pneumatic International worked with a robotics and automation um, academic within the BRL on this project. And these are some of the actual project outcomes that the team achieved. Um, I just wanted to share a few of my favorite things about KTP as well. So um, the first of those is that it is a very facilitated process. So you have a knowledge transfer advisor there to help you and guide you. But um, most universities also have an in-house uh, KTP team or office who are also there to help you find academics, shape your proposal um, and even write it as well, which is pretty fantastic. It's it's really agile. It's got a quick turnaround. So, for example, we've had an inquiry that came in from a business at the beginning of June and um, they have approval now to go um, go for a September submission um, to, to the KTP. So that's pretty quick. And all applications, you'll hear your outcome within 12 weeks of submission. So because of that facilitated process, it's also a really high success rate. So only the ideas that are right for this fund get as far as application. But that means that 90% of those projects submitted are funded. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a very valuable use of time. So moving on to collaborative R&D, I'm going to have a quick bit of a focus on EPSRC, which is the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, because it seems to fit the audience pretty well. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with EPSRC, but they, they fund early um, exploratory R&D at the TRLs level one to three. Uh, challenge led and responding to key economic and societal challenges is really key um, and we find that the strongest proposals are those that have um, that have collaboration built in at the outset with both the people that can identify the challenges that you are you are exploring but also those that can respond to those challenges so for example if there's a if there's a research um, r d project looking at AR capabilities in healthcare, um, having a, having a um, a tech company that's that's going to be actually making those those products um, in the future, as well as um, clinicians who are going to be kind of informing what challenges might be that they might be seeing. Having that in your project team from the outset is really valuable, um, and it might be uh, from an industry partner's point of view, you might be looking to have. Um, a case study included in an EPSRC project and from that work you may gain some useful insights into um, new new areas of development, new areas of knowledge that you could take on within your company in later stage R&D after the fact. So that might be that you, look, you then get in touch with Innovate and explore what kind of feasibility funding opportunities there are. So um, I've, I've also given a summary on the next slide of some of the live um, funding calls that EPSRC have out at the moment. Now, these calls, um, 
that there's a range of project structures, different scales, different time scales, different application processes. Um, but I would say with all of these calls, they they are strengthened by involvement of relevant industries within the within the project design. I would also say that um, that collaborative R and D is really well suited for longer term partnerships. Um, not to, it, it could definitely be the first. It could definitely be the start of a partnership. So it could be a great way to kick off a relationship between a business and a university. Um, but it is a longer term um, mechanism. So it can take you a while to find the right call for you. It can take two to six months to write a good proposal. It can then take you up to nine months to hear the outcome of that proposal. So it's it's not as agile as a KTP for sure, but it's um, it's a it's a very valuable um, long term way of working. And, and we find that, that many of the most fruitful relationships we have are built up over the long time. So, so please don't be put off by those timescales. And I would say that um, it's my job and, and the job of colleagues like mine across the universities in the UK to help, help you all find the right mixture of fast money and slow money to get the best out of your kind of collaborative opportunities. So I'll move on to... A very different type of funding which is which is definitely fast money so um ue has a portfolio of business support programs that offer um grant funding skills development workshops i'm just going to run through a few examples of some of our live projects so um first off we have the digital innovation fund which is for smes in the west of england region um this is funded by weka um fantastically so this is um the west of england lep region and it's offering grants um there are three grand seed grants available at the minute there are larger grants potentially available in the autumn but that's going to be demand led so if you are interested do get in touch with me um, to register that demand. Those larger grants are between 10 and 40,000 pounds and they can fund 35% um, of your project costs. So if you're an SME looking to innovate and grow, then get in touch. And um, our next project is, the, uh, is a very similar um, project design for the Swindon and Wiltshire region. Um, so also for SMEs um, and that has larger grants application open now. So do get in touch. I've got some contact details coming up towards the end. Uh, we also have a digital skills program, which is slightly different. So this offers um, CPD in-house capability within your business to really help grow um, your kind of digital capabilities and overcome any barriers to digital transformation. So please do look at um, get in touch with me if you'd like to find out more about that program it's it's relatively new and it is part of weka's um wider workforce for the future program so um please do get in touch with the weka growth hub as well to find out more about that program if you're based in the west of england and you've not heard of it before so i'd just like to finish up with a with a final case study which is um which is DETI, which is digital engineering technology and innovation so those in the region have hopefully heard of this program it's um it's funded by weka as well but it's very much co-designed and developed with weka and university of bristol and ue and many other partners are on the bottom right of the screen there um so this is a fantastic collaboration that that really operates across the the creative r d and the business support landscape that i've run through which is its its mission really so it has several different overlapping strands it's um it's been it's been um operating some early stage research that's really looking at the enabling capabilities for for digital engineering sector in the future it's also funding some um proof of concept projects and those five main boxes on the screen there um, that's just lifted from the DETI website so if you do go online you can look in more detail at those projects but those are all projects that have been funded where companies are collaborating with an academic um, to um, to kind of help uh, sorry, yeah, um, to, to help identify the real opportunities for digital engineering. And then underlining all of that is a DETI skills program. So as outputs to all of that work, there should be um, and there will be um, tangible training that that will be available to businesses to help upskill your workforce to kind of enable that future digital engineering workshop uh, workforce. 
So, and then this, yeah, this slide has some of the um, the sign up information. If you want to sign up to our um, RBI and UE's business um, newsletter, um, you please do so at that link there. Um, there's also a direct link to the UE business team. And I, I've given a bit of a flavour of our current calls, but we are looking to develop future programmes around clean growth um, and digital skills is kind of here to stay as well. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. And please do get in touch if you'd like to discuss anything else in more detail. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, yes, I'm Sam Bell and I'm the Senior Partnership Lead for the West of England Growth Hub, which is the business support uh, arm of the West of England Combined Authority, or WECA. Um, so I've got a really brief presentation for you today. I can't fit everything in that we do, um, but I will start with, with, with uh, some of the support that I think may be uh, relevant for this audience. Um, as part of one of our pillars is financial and business support. Um, and we have access to an amazing tool called Grant Finder, uh, which is um, we are, we're able to, to access regional, national uh, grants on your behalf. Um, we can really hone in on, on what it is you're looking for um, to make sure that, that we, we find the right grants and the right funding, which is um, available. Um, and we'll take you through that every step of the way. And so that's one of the, the tools that we, we, we have access to. Um, the next slide, please. Um, we also have um, on loan from the Intellectual Property Office um, a IP uh, policy advisor. Um, we've got a two-year um, secondment with, with, with David Hopkins, who some of you may have, may have heard of. Um, so Dave is working with us to work with businesses within the West of England region and offer one-to-one -one, uh, IP support. And as most of you will know, um, IP can account for over 70% of your business value. Um, so it's a really important part of any growing um, business. So please get in contact if we can support you um, either way with that. We also have our um, executive advisors, which have also all gone on masterclasses for IP, so could give you advice um, uh, around that as well. But more importantly, uh, David Hopkins uh, can do one-to-one -one business support around IP on that for you. Um, so please do get in contact if we can support. Um, and then around our technology and innovation um, sector development team, we've got the second call out for the Business Innovation Fund. The first round was really, really successful. Um, so you can register for interest for this one now by the going to the West of England Growth Hub website. Um, we're hoping to open the window um, probably mid-July. Um, so anybody that pre-registers will then get a, get an email to, to register um, their interest and go to then go to full application. Um, business Innovation um, Fund awards grants to support eligible businesses, obviously, in order to bring new and enhanced products to the market. Um, and you'll also get um, this match funding, and it's a collaborative um, within our region with um, research institutes as well. You'll get the re um, support on IP testing and development roadmaps, but also bespoke research development and uh, uh, innovation action plan um, as well. And this is um, part funded through the um, ERDF, the European Regional Development Fund. Um, as well. Um, there's lots more that we do and for any businesses that might may be here outside of the West of England region, we also have our Invest Bristol in Bath team um, who look after our investment in trade. Um, so both our contact details um, are on there. Get in touch with, with one of the um, one of our project support officers or executives by going through to the West of England Growth Hub. Um, and for those of you um, looking to maybe investment or moving into the region, uh, please contact our Bristol and Bath team who will be more than happy to, to speak to you. There's lots more that we offer, lots more in the way of different grants around low carbon and energy. Um, but today is... Uh, a little bit brief so please do take a look at the website and all of the fully funded support that um, that we offer and thank you for your time thank you
Sean, you're muted at the moment. Um, I, I still can't hear you, Sean. Sorry. No, it's still nothing. Yeah. It's not just me. Ah, Any better? There well, we go. Yeah, I hear uh, you loud and clear. Sorry about that, everyone. I was just saying it's the most common phrase, I think, over the past few months, you're on mute, and I've fallen into that trap. So <laughs> apologies. Uh, I'll, I'll start again. Apologies for that. Uh, so my name is Sean Jordan. Uh, I work in uh, an area of the Bristol Robotics Laboratory called RIF Bristol. Uh, RIF stands for the Robotics Innovation Facility. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that area today, primarily because uh, lots of the schemes uh, and activities that others have mentioned in this presentation uh, can be um, used uh, for the, the services and activities that go on in the RIF. Um, so we are essentially the um, the industry facing part of BRL, if you like. Uh, there's lots of industry collaboration across the laboratory, but we we only get involved in that, so we don't undertake any blue sky research. Uh, we're funded by both private and public income, and uh, have a broad area of engagement with lots of different organisations, uh, from startups and individual entrepreneurs right up to larger companies and public bodies. Uh, we've got quite a lot of tech in in our room in the robotics lab, so we've got uh, five industrial robot arms that we can draw on for, for particular projects and we've got uh, conveyors and, and lots of other bits of kit at our disposal uh, and essentially we provide research uh, consultancy and training services to to a wide range of clients uh, understandably we're in the robotics lab so we have expertise in robotics and automation but also our engineers cover mechanical engineering mechatronics and the other things uh, listed on the slide there um, and uh, we um, all of that expertise and, and our, our services are applied uh, to help uh, organizations to to prove their technology, to experiment with technology, to get used to using robotics and, and other tech. A lot of what we do is focused on that valley of death, that, that area between discovery of, of technology and its commercial application. So we get involved in a lot of prototyping, proof of concept, uh, testing and trialing, uh, and our, that's what our engineers spend a lot of time doing. Uh, and on the next slide, I can explain how we, we go about doing that. Uh, so we, you've heard about uh, KTPs and smart grants and uh, EPSRC funding. Uh, all of those things can be used uh, in, in the robotics innovation facility. So we work with clients that have uh, successfully applied to UKRI for the, that kind of funding. Uh, sometimes we apply with them as a partner and sometimes we're a subcontractor uh, for them. So there's, there's lots of different ways that we can engage through uh, UKRI. And similarly, through the European funding routes, we've got an EIDF funded project that I'll talk about uh, in a moment that's SME specific, but we also um, uh, get involved in, in Horizon uh, Europe and, and other schemes. Uh, the, the West of England uh, grant schemes that you heard about through SAM, uh, that, that can uh, be used to um, to work with us potentially and uh, also we, we sometimes get funded privately by clients that are just looking for some training or some some research support so all of those different funding mechanisms and schemes it's always worth talking to us if you're interested in applying for them or if you successfully applied to one of them and you need some robotics automation manufacturing support uh, we could be a place that you come uh, to, to to use those funds or to bid for those funds um, if we could move to the next slide. Um, so here's some examples of our current programs, uh, and this will give an example of how, how we're funded from those different sources. So the Sabre program, which I'll go into some more detail about shortly, is um, funded by the ERDF, uh, whereas um, the some of our other programs are funded through other European schemes. Uh, and we've also got uh, Reinstate, which is a, a robotic welding project, and that's funded through Rolls-Royce. So we have uh, individual clients uh, and also public funds um, allowing our engineers to, to give some support. Uh, we, we also undertake commercially funded training in R&D, uh, but I'll go into a bit, bit more detail now about the Sabre program specifically. So this is an EIDF funded program that we host at RIF Bristol. It's a £1 million project focused on, on the west of England, so Bristol, Bath and the surrounding areas, North Somerset, South Gloss. Uh, and uh, through uh, this scheme, we can provide some real hands-on support to SMEs. Uh, 
the first area that we help them through is uh, knowledge exchange workshops. Uh, I've got some d details about those here. So th there are two day duration. Um, we provide some introductory talks and a tour of the robotics lab. And then the attendees get a chance to get really uh, hands on with our robots and undertake some practical exercises with, with a range of robot arms. So we're, we're brand agnostic. We always say we're not tied to a particular manufacturer of technology. Uh, we, we give people the opportunity, even if they've never seen a robot before, to come into the lab and, and try out some different robotic technologies. They're free to attend, no experience required. Um, COVID has uh, scuppered those in the short term. We're hoping to start running them again soon or to look at some online uh, alternatives. But um, but it gives you a taster of the, the sort of training that we can provide. And sometimes we, we get asked to do that uh, by, by independent clients that just want to train their staff um, on, on how to operate robotics, uh, robotic technology. Uh, technology development projects. This is an example of where we go a bit more in depth. Our engineers get hands on on a one to one basis. So uh, it's not a bunch of people coming in to be trained. It's one individual or organization that we can work with on their specific requirements so they get dedicated support access to our workspace our hardware our expertise and uh, for a period of five days to 12 weeks spread over a year in the past um, we've been able to help them with their prototyping their concept development whatever's needed we can apply our expertise to help them um, we've been able to do that free of charge for SMEs in the west of England through the Sabre program uh, we're hoping that that will be extended uh, over the next um, a uh, couple of years, we're, we're waiting to hear on that, but it gives you a taster of the sort of format that we strive to provide uh, regardless. Uh, so that's the Sabre program. A uh, quick case study, uh, here's an example of one company that came through the Sabre program, uh, Farm Studio Films, they're, they're a, a well-known uh, company operating in Bristol's natural history sector, uh, film sector. So they produce a lot of footage for uh, natural history productions on, on television. They wanted to uh, get involved in, in macro filming. So filming very, very close to, to very small things and following unpredictable creatures. Uh, and a human holding a camera is quite limited in, in what they can do. Uh, if you imagine something running around a branch or a log, a human following that it can get tangled up quite easily. So um, we, we helped them to develop a robotic solution. Uh, we developed an affordable robotic arm solution, uh, tested it, provided an interface for them. And on the next slide, you'll see that they've now managed to take that technology forwards. So they purchased a robot arm based on that project and the advice we could give them uh, and that proof of concept. Uh, and they've used that for everything from shooting advertisements to those the, the original intention of, of macro filming for nature programs. So we took them from having no robotics experience through to being able to operate a robot themselves and purchasing the correct technology for the, the job they wanted to achieve. Uh, and uh, just some key stats. So over the past uh, two and a half years, the Sabre program specifically has worked with almost 70 SMEs. Um, but the, the, the RIF has got a longer history than that. It's supported over 620 clients since 2013. I created a lot of new jobs and, and GVA. So we've, we've had a lot of successes that the KTP that Alison talked about, that was um, undertaken by the head of, of RIF Bristol. So we've, we've got experience across those funding streams. Um, and, and we're always looking for new clients to work with, new ways to help um, to boost new jobs and, and, and GVA and to, to try and improve turnover and all the other things that hopefully automation can help our clients to achieve. Uh, so thanks very much. It was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but if, if there's a, a, any of that that's of interest to you, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, I'd be delighted to talk to you in more detail. Thanks very much. Wow, fantastic stuff. That was a, um, a huge uh, amount of information from everyone there, um, but I am going to um, make a little bit of time. I know we're going over. Commenders very kindly agreed to, to start a little bit late um, just to ask a, a couple of questions here. Um, I'm just going to try something as well because I'm not sure how many people can bring on uh, screen at a time. Um, but um, I'm going to go with uh, Greg Cox's question first, um, mainly because he asked some very good questions in the last talk we didn't have time to get to. Um, Greg asked, does the BRL support bid writing for Innovate UK um, or the other funding opportunities he's presented, uh, as quite rightly identifies, bid writing is an art to itself and does have substantial cost. Would anyone like to um, answer that? Alison, are you in a position? Let me add you back in then. Um, you're muted as well. Hi, everyone. Am I 
Yep. You now hear me. Yes, brilliant. I would say, um, so within the team I sit in, the research, business and innovation team, we have capacity to support bid writing where there is a UE academic involved in, um, in a proposal. And I would say most universities are probably the same. Um, but some of the programme support that the ERDF and WECA project that I um, outlined that one of the digital innovation ones had a bid writing workshop that can help you maybe upskill somebody within your team with that capability but I do um, agree it's an art it's time consuming so yeah yeah that's brilliant I, I add to that as well I, we, we've had quite a lot of success um, with, with everyone's help here uh, in writing innovate bids um, and it is definitely an art form it's very time consuming and it's so competitive now. But if you if you contact us, if you contact the people that perhaps you're interested in, in talking with, we do have quite a lot of experience and successful experience in, in getting funding from Innovate. Um, the next question, um, I'll leave you on, Alison, just in case you've got an answer to this. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's three questions. Um, the, the first two are, are, are join into one, um, but it's how can uh, artists or designers collaborate with roboticists used to find collaborators and access funding if not associated with universities um, and whether or not you have to have a business to access the funding is that something you can help with or, or anyone else would like to jump in with i mean i Quite. think there are I can jump in initially to say there's definitely opportunities and routes um, for, for both of those things. I think it's a it would probably worth having a conversation with, with me or a colleague to kind of find out a bit more what you're trying to do, because there's so many different funding opportunities out there that are all asking for different things. Um, I think if that you would need to be registered as a business to apply for Innovate UK funding, but, but we do have... Um, both UE and Bristol University are involved in different collaborations. There's um, Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. Um, if you Google that and have a look, that that runs um, that runs kind of seed funding and other funded projects for collaborations between artists, individuals, and is all about interdisciplinarity. Um, but increasingly, the U the research councils are funding interdisciplinary work. So the Arts and Humanities Research Council fund a lot. Um, with EPSRC, with ESRC and with others. So interdisciplinarity is is definitely a um, very popular, very valuable way of working. So I, I'd be happy to have a, a chat through any of your ideas if you'd like. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have to um, leave the final question there, I'm afraid, which had to do with uh, copyright. Um, but just briefly say that that that's often written into the, the bid itself, how that works and, and can reside entirely with the um, the, the person who, who comes up with everything or, or shared. Um, so thanks for that. Obviously, that was a huge amount of information for everyone, um, but very useful too, I hope. Um, I'm going to move swiftly on to Praminda now, if if she's around. Uh, Praminda, are you, are you here? Yeah. yeah. Um, so Hi. Praminda's going to talk us through. She's um, Another stalwart of the the Bristol Robotics Lab, um, and very well known for her work in assistive robotics. And she sat uh, next to the the wonderful studio uh, behind her. Um, so I don't know if you've got any slides to share, Pramenda, or is um, it yes, I do. Yes, oh, I okay. do. So if I share my screen, and um, uh, okay, it doesn't give me the choice of which. Oh yeah, it does. There, there might goes. be a tab at the top. Yeah, yeah, there is. There is. I don't have any videos, so I'll just do. Perfect. Ah, wonderful. Yep, I can see it. So I'll add that in and hand over straight away to you. Okay. Thanks there for the introduction, Mark. Um, in this talk, I'm going to review standards and regulations for physically assisted robots that currently exist in relation to supporting people in the home, as well as in different care settings. And I've been working on this with my colleagues here in the Bristol Robotics Lab, um, uh, this particular bit of work uh, with Dr. Chris Harper, uh, who is a safety uh, engineer. And, um, and we've been doing this work as part of the Assuring Autonomy International Program, which has been sponsored by the Lloyd's Register Foundation uh, via York University. Um, in reviewing current assistive robotic standards and approaches, we found that these don't actually adequately take into consideration 
safety aspects relating to typical users of physically assisted robots. And these are people who will have varying accessibility needs. Accessibility needs that result from a wide range of sensory, physical, and cognitive impairments. And um, for those who are designing and developing assistive robots, it's important to have guidance regarding how these should be addressed as part of ensuring safety and deployment of physically assistive robots in particularly in complex real world context. So what I'm going to do in this talk is um, set the scene for physically assistive robots, um, go into a little bit on end user accessibility needs and safety related concerns. I'm going to review existing standards and regulations and then talk about opportunities for future research developments. Um, I'm sure that everyone will be aware of our changing demographics worldwide. And according to data from the World Population Prospects, um, by 2050, one in six people will be over the age of 65. And it's great people are living longer, but the incidence of poor health from long term conditions is also growing. In the UK, one in five of those who are over 80. Uh, will need some form of regular care. And due to these changing demographics, there's already a rapidly growing shortage of staff in social and healthcare sectors. The World Health uh, Organization estimates a projected shortfall of 18 million uh, healthcare workers by 2030. And so with limited number of care staff available, we need some smart solutions that can deal with the complexity of maintaining and supporting a high quality of life for everyone. Now, patients and users have got, who are potential users of this uh, assistive uh, technology have got very complex multiple diseases and conditions. And the problem is no two people are likely to have identical needs. And the complexity of impairments that have to be considered is further compounded by the fact that not only do people have more than one condition, but these occur along a multi-dimensional continuum and can change over time in a non-deterministic manner. And actually the change can be even over a period of a day. So, you know, you might feel perfectly fine in the morning as the day wears on, um, the arthritis starts to become more painful, et cetera. And also the severity of impairments can vary as well. So I've um, illustrated this in relation to this Rockwood clinical frailty scale. And um, as part of our work, we did some uh, research with a uh, home care service provider. And this is a tag cloud of just 20 of their service users. Um, and look at the range of comorbidities in just this small cohort. Uh, as a result of these illnesses, people have varying ranges of impairments, which result in quite different experiences, and hence their needs will be different. So with impairments related to mobility, vision, hearing, we need to consider how an assistive robot would provide, for example, information to the person in a way that's accessible. And from a safety point of view, that is really important. We need to make sure that that communication doesn't uh, result uh, in um, problems just because the person is unable to interpret uh, the information correctly. So from a usability point of view, we need to also consider which modality, which interaction or communication modality will be most suitable and also how it might need to be adapted or configured as the user's needs change so that errors don't occur due to problems with this perception of information, as I said. So the assistance from a robot needs to be adaptable and human robot interaction, sensory motor behavior, should be easily reconfigurable to different user needs and characteristics. So the safety uh, considerations are about the system being able to personalize, not only to the person's clinical and cognitive and psychological needs, but also their living environment. And we note that the operational conditions uh, are going to be complex and multivariate, with, often with no analytical solutions. And so it's vital to design not just the technology, but also methods that take into consideration how the system will need to be configured or is uh, reconfigurable on the fly to these individual care needs 
and also the approaches that can ensure that the context of use can be more fully understood and integrated into the um, system safety architecture. Over the last eight to 10 years, we've seen a number of new robot platforms emerge and also disappear, uh, which is uh, an interesting um, part of developing an ecosystem where people become dependent on these robots as well. But that's a, a topic for another session. Uh, the level of physical assistance required by, for example, an older person with a disability will vary, like I said, along a continuum. And low physical assistance maybe adds lower clinical frailty levels and higher as the person becomes more frail or disabled. And we find that while the physicality of the interaction required increases with increasing frailty and assistive needs, there is little reference to their people's accessibility needs, um, those who will be using this technology. And indeed also, and this is a really important point, considerations for the carers of the clinical staff who will be needing to configure or deploy these robots. And these are often, um, we find, not at all represented in the functionality that's available. Um, so some examples of our applications of physical assistive robots that we've been investigating here in the Bristol Robotics Lab are robots for sit-to-stand mobility assistance, such as this uh, Chiron Juva uh, ceiling-based robot, which we developed here uh, in the lab. And then we've also been evaluating this um, Leo Walker robot. And assistive robots can provide a range of functional support. And this is, this is also important uh, because uh, we need to ensure that the functionality um, is also considerate of the dynamic environments in which it will be uh, provided. So for example, a physical assistance robot providing you support in the kitchen will be quite different to the environment in the bathroom, for example. So this leads to the need to conduct validation and verification in different scenarios. And specifically for us to consider operation in unstructured environments where the person is interacting with these technologies uh, and their sensory and cognitive and mobility impairments are going to be really important to uh, factor into the interaction. And we have found that existing approaches for validation and verification of assisted robots lack adequate consideration of these complex needs. So for us, it's an exciting research area to be working on, but also one of the things that we are concerned with is people who are developing these systems are aware of what already exists. So ensuring operational safety uh, in real world context being the major barrier limiting the deployment of these assistive robots in care facilities and homes. And we've been reviewing some of the regulatory conditions, and here are some of these. Um, just put them uh, on for information. Um, it'll be interesting if you're uh, if you want to delve in these into these further. But what we are looking is, do they provide the coverage that we need in terms of the risk assessment and hazard identification that needs to happen? And we found that there are key gaps. Uh, on, like I was saying, being able to take into consideration these changing needs of people, particularly those who have progressive conditions. And so if assistive robots are to be used uh, in real world scenarios, then these requirements and understanding how the requirements are assessed, as well as the training needs that staff will need to have in order to be able to utilize these systems also needs to be considered. So uh, we've been um, looking at for in our particular uh, scenarios where we're supporting people with mobility needs, um, lifting operations and lifting equipment regulations. So what we're doing is we are looking across the board at different industrial standards which people are already using and seeing uh, whether these are fit for purpose and how they can uh, and should be adapted. Um, so if we're going to make any headway in getting assistive robots accepted by specifically in our case, regulatory bodies, um, we need to ensure that a comprehensive risk assessment has been carried out or can be carried out, particularly given the technical complexity, given the functionality that these systems have to support, um, 
And we're dealing with lack of sufficient data with respect to potential risks that can arise and, um, and the accidents that might result. So we are, if you like, at a, a, a situation where because we don't have enough data of this real world operational context, it's difficult for us to be able to develop uh, and um, develop the standards that will provide the type of coverage that we need. So what we're doing is starting to understand this multitude of non-functional requirements, which will impact user safety, um, and use a systematic process for recognizing and incorporating these complex contextual issues. Uh, but again, a review of uh, the literature on hazard analysis and safety for robotic and autonomous systems reveals that there's not there are not many approaches at all which consider the dynamic changes in people's uh, impairments and conditions. Uh, and common hazard analysis approaches tend to be internal, mission focused, and do not address the issue of external non mission interactions and hazards. And this is a major concern for autonomous systems. And in addition to this, there are also ethical hazards to, con uh, to consider. Uh, once people become dependent on these systems, if the systems start to over support them, are they going to lose some of their uh, existing um, functions, for example? Uh, and that in itself uh, is something that needs to be considered. Providing too much support in this context can actually be harmful to the person. And we see this uh, in the case of using mobility scooters. Um, prevalence of the use of mobility scooters uh, means that people are uh, getting weaker and are not able to support themselves with some of their activities of daily living. Um, and so another uh, interesting uh, approach uh, that uh, has been developed uh, by Dr. Chris Harper and colleagues is the environmental survey hazard analysis approach, which uh, does take into consideration context and changes in the context uh, in how the environment is analyzed. Uh, but uh, we're, um, Dr. Harper is working on developing this further in terms of um, it's the approach to systematic representation and coverage. Another interesting approach that could be considered is the ecological interface design, uh, which was introduced specifically for socio-technical, real-time and complex dynamic systems. And it uses a skills, rules, knowledge framework. And that can help designers combine information requirements for a system uh, and aspects of human cognition. Uh, so one of the things that's been missing, we've been working with industrial robots where there is an assumption of um, somebody being quite mentally uh, uh, capable, cognitively alert, etc. Although fatigue uh, is an important issue to consider when it comes to safety of uh, robots in industrial settings, as well as uh, cognitive load and distractions. Uh, however, um, because robots haven't been used with uh, vulnerable users who might have cognitive impairments. Nobody's really uh, considered adequately what implications that will have. And this is something that also needs to be considered in terms of legal requirements uh, and um, insurance, et cetera, of these um, technologies. So where are we at now? Um, there is still many ethical issues to consider, as I was saying earlier, with using assistive robots. Um, and so we should be really uh, alert to the possibility that robots used in care settings could, if not deployed properly, dehumanize caring practice. And I'm really concerned about that by potentially reducing human-human interactions. And uh, I'm really pleased that the European Parliament resolution on civil law rules of robotics is starting to uh, look at this. I hope that the UK continues to be part of this as well. Um, end users of physically assisted robots are likely to have complex needs and characteristics. Um, so while currently available, relevant healthcare um, safety standards and regulations provide some key guidance to ensure that design requirements comply with and drawn best practice. Uh, assistive robots, which adopt a novel approach to how assistance is provided, are a step change compared to existing ways of supporting and delivering care. And so 
it's really important for us to use, continue to use participatory design um, so that an individual's care needs as well as their complex user conditions and context can be more fully understood and properly integrated into the system safety architecture from the conceptual stage of design. And this uh, would help to ensure that safety considerations are not only personalized to people's clinical needs, but also to their living contexts and environments. And we found that there are still gaps uh, in efficient methods for listing and ensuring coverage of all these safety related requirements as well as uh, the processes. So it's not just about the standard, it's al also about how we go about uh, doing the analysis uh, to ensure compliance to standards and defining emerging standards. So in order to ensure we have the appropriate legal frameworks to govern the use of robots, more work is going to be needed and we need to be working and that's why uh, I was very keen to yeah, present at this event because we need to be working with uh, our industrial partners in developing methods for safety analysis and risk assessment in real world contexts as well as approaches for verification and validation. So that's where I'll end. Thank you. And uh, uh, look forward to any questions that you might have. Oh, Mark, you're that's in here. Yeah. Uh, shall I yeah. stop sharing, Mark? I'm just going to stop sharing. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, uh, that was fascinating, Fravinda, as as ever, and very good to see that um, you're thinking about the the obvious needs and the regulatory frameworks that are needing to be in place. Um, I've got a quick question actually about it to do with the fact um, from from the psych Psychological point of view, I suppose, and, and it's good to see that, that you know people are thinking about that because obviously the the older generations, the amount of technological advance that they will have seen in their life means that you know the, the things that I see in the assisted living studio and stuff are, are essentially alien to them, uh, and these people might well be um, suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's um, or perhaps uh, physically in pain. Um, how much? work can you do to or perhaps in your experience um of, of seeing how the elderly interact with these ro uh, robots do you think there's going to be much um resistance to it um so it's it's going to vary so we've got you know the the eager people the early adopters etc so we're going to have that whole cycle of um people but one one of the things that we've been doing is just just to address that mark uh um, for our initial work on the chiron project uh, we took people from uh, residential care homes to our science museum in Bristol, um, at Bristol. Now it's called Read the Curious. And we have that, had them interacting with some um, new interfaces and experiences because we wanted to see how they would respond to these uh, new ways of interacting. And, you know, the thing about us humans is we're, we are excited by innovation. We are excited by um, interesting new ways of um, 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 doing things. But what's most important is we uh, we need to be think well. People are motivated to use these technologies because it's about improving their ability to be able to carry out their aspirations. You know, so if uh, I'm stuck at home. Uh, because I've got only two visits a day, 15 minutes by a carer who rushes in and rushes out. And then there is a technology which will enable me to be able to get myself dressed, get myself out, be able to do things around the house, keep it clean, etc. That's also part of the whole assisted living ecosystem. Uh, then people are more open uh, to these technologies. So when technologies are seen as a tool, just like a washing machine or dishwasher, really, that's when, you know, um, and that's how we should be selling these. It's not a substitute for uh, human to human care. That always has to be there and exist. You know, that's what makes us human. Uh, yeah. But uh, looking more at these technologies as tools uh, to get out and about and do what you want to do. That's that's brilliant. Very, very interesting. You get to see that that sort of idea of you know the tools, the the functionality over the the replacement of humans. I suppose mm -hmm. it's very important. Um, well, thank you, Praminda, um, and thank you to all our speakers. This draws uh, session two of track two to a close. 
I think there's a um, a group uh, Q&A forum going on on track one at the moment. So feel free to jump over to that. And um, we'll be starting back here um, on track two at two o'clock this afternoon. Uh, so hopefully see you then uh, for another range of uh, interesting talks. Thank you Thank all. You. Thanks, Dave.